Alrighty. Let's do this. I'm still getting uh, really bad. Bit rate. It's dropping a bunch of frames. Okay, well. Turn the volume on the music down a little bit. All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, got a new mic set up, and I'm kind of got a weird tinny sound that doesn't seem to show up uh, in other things but um, it's happening here in my in my headphones anyway so um, I may depending on how this goes I may actually uh, turn my um, set my microphone up out of the way here um, I may actually take my headphones off and just talk into uh, talk directly into nothing and see how that goes all right um, let me see if I have information about viewers and stuff like that um, Put that over here. All right. Well, we're going to try this. Having really bad luck with my uh, bit rate today. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's my connection or if it's the internet in general it's bouncing all over the place restream wasn't working at all so I'm streaming just directly to Twitch now um, anyway I'm going to treat it as though as though I'm stream into both and I'll, I'll maybe I'll upload this later all right so um, I'll go ahead and get started here so yeah I'm echoing zero kbps Are there problems with other streams? Are other people having problems? Turn off the audio coming from the computer and see if Through, a, through an ad. I'm not bringing up on my screen just in case. I don't want anyone to get mad at me for sharing their stream on mine. Looks like Miko's not having any problems. It's probably just me. I 
the internet that I have is apparently terrible. Okay, I'm not even going to bother looking at it anymore. I'm going to start recording. And I'll upload it later to, uh, to YouTube. Okay, so uh, I'm going to set up my Windows machine to do a little bit of uh, C programming. Now, you can use Visual Studio uh, to do C programming. Um, you can install just the, you can use Visual Studio, you can install just the compiler um, and run that as well. Um, I'm... I, I'm, what I'd like to do is a little bit of uh, Linux programming. So what I'm going to do is set up um, the Windows subsystem for Linux, and you can see that here. So um, make this a little, a little larger. So for anyone who is out of the loop, anyone that doesn't know, um, Microsoft started working a lot more within the open source space and they've added uh, the ability to run Linux basically um, not necessarily as a virtual machine. Um, it's kind of like a virtual machine, but it's uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux basically translate any, translates any um, calls to the Linux kernel um, translates that into a Windows um, native call and then uh, allows that to run. It, it's kind of like a virtual machine, but but different. I, I don't know exactly what makes it different there, um, but it, they don't call it a virtual machine. So um, instead of installing a virtual machine system or anything like that, instead what you can do is install this Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I've already gone through the setup for this uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go over setting it up exactly um, because uh, I, I recommend always go to the source. So in this case, um, the, the Windows Docs, um, I got to this just searching for in, installing Windows uh, WSL for Linux. There's um, WSL and WSL2, um, and the steps are going to be uh, possibly different um, a year from now, if you come across this. So, uh, that's why I, I'm not making a guide or anything like that. This is just, I'm going to go through, um, what I've got set up, um, to kind of show how I have this set up. Uh, so if anyone wants to try this, they can. Um, there is a, the, the simplified install. Um, I believe for that, you have to have, um, yeah, it says you have to have a preview build of um, uh, Windows 10, um, which I, I don't have. Instead, I did the manual install, uh, and if we skip down to that, it's really not that, that difficult. Um, the manual install, all you have to do is run this command from a PowerShell. It sets up the Windows subsystem for Linux, version 1. It only sets up version 1. Uh, and then you have to, to be able to install um, version 2, you have to check your system requirements. Um, you know, go to, you know, right-click on the Windows icon, go to system. Um, I don't think I want to bring that up because it may have some information about my system that I don't want to share, but... Um, it says here that the um, version uh, 1903 or higher, uh, my version says 2004. So, um, so it's higher. Uh, and so I was able to set that up uh, doing these steps. Um, okay. It is using, it is using a virtual machine um, in some way, shape or form. And my music is not playing anymore. Oh, because I turned it off. <laughs> I 
turn it off so I could have, uh, so I wouldn't share audio from uh, Twitch on it where I was getting it from. Okay, so in this case, um, you run a few commands and it sets up Windows Virtual Machine um, for, for Linux. Um, or sorry, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Um, I believe I went through all of these different uh, things. Um, either way it goes, I have it set up on my system now. Um, and then you go through and you install the Linux distro of your choice. Um, and that's actually on the Microsoft Store. It's kind of funny that that's, that's where you get it. Um, I have, uh, I like Debian. I've used Debian a lot in the past, so that's the one I went with. Um, once you, and I'm not going to open the store, um, since I already have it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but all it will do is, is set you up with, um, creating user account and getting, uh, getting everything going, uh, for you to be able to use, uh, um, Linux, the Linux terminal uh, from within Windows. Um, and then it recommends installing this uh, Windows um, terminal, which I actually, I really like, I recommend. Um, it has, it has tabs. It lets you um, open up the uh, WSL um, Linux distributions. You can have, you can have a mix of tabs between PowerShell and um, and Linux and just the standard command prompt. Um, it's really nice. Um, so yeah, you set that up, then you uh, run a couple of other things to make sure that your um, WSL is set to the right version. And let me go ahead and bring up, I have the terminal, Windows terminal here. Um, and it's, uh, I wonder if I can increase the font size, I can. There we go. I don't want to put that. Okay, that works. So anyway, um, and the way it's kind of nice, the way it's already set up. Um, if you do WSL dash dash list, so you can see I, I also have Docker set up. Uh, you can see um, I've got Debian as my default. Um, so then here in the dropdown, when you go to open a new tab, you get an option for PowerShell and you get an option for Debian as well. Um, and you may have noticed there's a little bit of a background here. Um, I like to have a different background, um, for each command prompt or sorry, for each terminal window, um, in the settings here. So in the settings, you go into the profiles for each, and there's so much customization in here. But if you go into the, um, in this case, command prompt appearance, um, you can choose color scheme. And then down here, background image, you can see I've got it pointing to my, um, I've got a folder called shells uh, or shell backgrounds that just contains a selection of photos. Um, and I set um, this one to have an opacity of 15. You can bump that up, like say 100%. And the background is, is a lot brighter. Um, I actually like that. I might keep that a little, um, not that bright. Maybe we'll, we'll bump it down to like a, a 75%. Okay, yeah. That way, when I open a command prompt window, I know that it's command prompt because that's the, that's the image I get. Um, I also have, if, if you see, I open up PowerShell, I have a different one here. Ooh, cross-platform PowerShell. Okay, so uh, PowerShell, a different background. That way I know if I'm switching Alt-Tab between the different screens, I know which one I'm in. Same thing for, and, and you can see there's keyboard shortcuts. Control-Shift-3 brings up Debian. And you can see my background there is the Debian um, uh, wallpaper um, and my air conditioning is coming on. So might be a little background noise. So the way this is all set up is that um, 
you know, the, this Windows terminal has these tabs, um, and that's the program here that they're recommending installing. You can also do, you can split it into uh, panes. Um, you have to memorize keyboard shortcuts for that, and I just haven't gotten good at that yet. Um, I did use, for a long time, uh, Sigewin, and um, I, maybe that's how you say it, I'm not sure. Um, and I use Tmux and Vim and, and things like that. Um, so I got really, really good at using the Windows, or sorry, the Linux um, uh, terminal. Um, but I'm a little out of practice there. So I'm going to close down a couple of these, but, um, but yeah. So, and then this, uh, if we do the verbose, we can see I've got these set to uh, run uh, the WSL version 2. Um, it's just making sure that, that you have the latest and greatest and uh, it's more compatible. Uh, if it's not set to two, you can you can use this command to, to change it to that. Um, so anyway, and then the default version. Um, okay, so that's setting up the Windows subsystem uh, for Linux. That was it was straightforward and easy. I just followed the steps um, in here. Uh, the only the only gotcha that I had that I ran into was you know the the simplified install meant, in, you know, running a, a preview build of Windows 10, and that seemed <laughs> that seemed kind of an overkill. Like I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't need to do that. So there's no need to do it. Um, years ago, when the WSL first came out, that's that's how you had to uh, to to run it, and that was that was version one. Uh, you had to install the the preview build because it was it was a beta, um, but that's not the case anymore. Um, so yeah, so it's all set up, good to go. Um, next, uh, so I've got okay, so I've got the terminal set up, and I can open up Debian, and <laughs> so I did a couple of things in here. First off. Um, I also installed uh, Visual Studio Code. I've had that set up uh, for other projects I've done. Um, if you've seen, uh, I did the Jeopardy uh, for Twitch uh, um, game. That was using uh, JavaScript uh, and Node and PM um, to, to set that up. Um, so what I did here was I, uh, I, I got the terminal set up and then I needed to get code, um, Visual Studio Code, uh, working from here so that um, it would actually show the, the path to Visual Studio Code's uh, uh, bin folder. Um, and that, I just had to add it to the path. So, uh, like I said, I use VI a lot um, in the past, or Vim a lot in the past, so pretty good with that. So, uh, tilde, um, uh, bash RC and you can see down here um, it's kind of small let me make that bigger so I've got an export of, of the path um, to yeah so this this uh, next to the last line here um, export is uh, how you set a, like a global variable so I have the um, path to Visual Studio code and all that stuff um, as well as the, the path tacked onto that. And then underneath that, you've seen that when I open up a new terminal window, um, it runs the fortune command, um, which gets a fortune cookie, is what they call it. Um, and then it runs cowsay, which uh, puts it in a little a little text box like that. And so it comes up, it's, it's off the screen, but um, if you type fortune, you get a fortune and it's random. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, things you can do with it. Um, I don't have a man installed. That seems... Uh, 
do I want that? Um, I'm gonna say no, because that, that looks like it's wanting to install other packages. Um, yeah, usually if you if you type man space whatever, um, that loads the manual for that. Um, you can do dash dash help. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that um, and oh yeah, that's another thing that will come up uh, if you are. Uh, in running, uh, you install Linux for the first, first time, you'll get a, um, you're not, uh, if you try to do sudo whatever, it'll say you're not uh, in the sudo sudoers file, this will be reported. Um, that's always kind of nerve wracking. Uh, that's, that's a common issue that a lot of people run into. And if you run into that, uh, I'll let you uh, go down that rabbit hole of uh, fun solving that. Um, it will probably come up, but uh, Stack Overflow is full of all kinds of... Uh, <laughs> if you just Google the error message, which is kind of how how programmers work. Um, but yeah, so I got this all set up. Um, the uh, Fortune, like I said, just spits out something you know random like that. And then... Um, how say uh, if you just type something like hello, it does that. So if you do um, fortune and you pipe that into Cal say, uh, and then Cal say has different features like uh, F for file, um, which is the, the cow file and tux is one of them. So that's the tux penguin. Um, <laughs> I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Uh, great tongue twister from um, Lord of the Rings there. So yeah, so that's set up uh, to to run every time I open a new uh, command uh, window. So open up a new one, and a random fortune comes up. Uh, at one point, I did this uh, also um, with. Uh, Shower thoughts from uh, Reddit um, r slash uh, shower thoughts. Uh, the problem with that is um, that every now and then there's some language or just something slightly uh, inappropriate for work. Um, and I like to use this on work machines. And actually, Fortune has some things like that as well, but uh, it's it's not a problem really. So anyway, okay, so that is my setup for bash um i i tend to like z shell um zsh uh for linux uh but it doesn't come standard on most installs and and i'm i'm trying to get to the point where if i log into a system i'm i'm using what's normally there like if i have to ssh into a, a server somewhere um i i'm not beholden to to things like say for example um z shell does some really nice things for uh auto completing what you're trying to type so um let's say if i go to my um uh, okay for example here if i want to go to i've got a, a folder inside my home directory here called programming um and actually we can take a look if i do ls it shows programming here um if i do Prog, you know, CD prog, and I hit tab to autocomplete, it, it it's it doesn't find anything because technically it should be capitalized. Uh, Z shell uh, would auto, you know, detect that, hey, you only have a PRO with a capital P, so it would, it was smart about that. I, I miss that, um, and I might go back to that, and that could be a feature of Z shell or oh my Z shell, um, which is a uh, like a plugin system for it. Um, but I, I I love and hate it because you know I, I use it all the time when when I'm you know using my system. But then if I log into another system, it's not there, and it's kind of like uh, 
you know, I, I just, I get so reliant on those things. So I'm trying not to do that anymore. So anyway, so my program, you can hear every time I, well, you might not be able to hear it. The audio is a little low. Every time I hit um, something, so example that, that's, that's the bell sound. Um, that's, yeah, it would, it would, that's, that's the, 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 it would beep if this was an old school computer. Um, and it, it's, it's some type of feedback. Z shell eliminated that a lot. Anyway, enough about Z shell. Uh, so if you hear that, it's because I'm just not used to using bash as much anymore. All right. So we have, um, Linux set up. Well, we have Debian set up, um, specifically Debian. Um, I, that's my, my, my choice. Uh, if you want to go Ubuntu, uh, by all means go Ubuntu. Um, there's multiple different types. There's SUS, there's, um, Fedora, I believe is one of the options. There's so many different, uh, options. Actually, you can see some of them listed here. Um, yeah, so SUS, OpenSUS, Debian, Kali Linux, um, Ubuntu, uh, yeah, Fedora is, is one of those, which is the free Red Hat. Um, so yeah, so once, once you have that set up, the next thing you have to do is actually, uh, run the, the update, which, uh, you saw me do there. Um, if you try just apt get update, you get errors like this saying that permission denied. So you got to do, um, sudo apt get update then your password it'll update all of all of the uh, package lists and um, I'll show you just an example um, these are not in sudo file yeah see so many people have this problem all the time I've already um, you know saw that on mine. Each system has its own way of uh, dealing with that too. I think Ubuntu may not even uh, have that problem to begin with. Um, I could be wrong though. So anyway, so we have the uh, WSL set up. Now we have uh, Debian set up. We want to install um, the packages needed for development. So um, that's sudo apt get install um, build essentials or build essential um, and then that installs that installs everything that you need I've already got everything uh, for that I've, I've already installed that package um, so I don't need to install it again once you have that installed you get GCC uh, in this case, it's, uh, 8.3. Um, it's a good idea also to go ahead and get, um, uh, install, um, uh, GDB, which is a debugger. Um, let's see. So yeah, you can see there I've got GDB installed. Uh, that comes in really handy uh, for uh, debugging as well as for um, uh, later when I set up Visual Studio Code to uh, debug um, uh, things or to yeah to run and debug my my applications uh, from within Windows. So I'll just show you what um, normally the the way this works. Once you have this set up and everything, and now I'm going to be writing C programs in Linux. Uh, from the Linux terminal, and then I'll show you uh, later on what we do to get that uh, moved over into, like, say, Windows. There's a reason why you would want to do C programming in Linux for, you know, at one point, or why you want to do it in uh, Windows at one point. For example, if you want to do something like um, uh, working with sockets or something like that, if you want to create your own server uh, or uh, like a like a client uh, or something like that. Uh, you know, you can find a lot of information on, you know, doing it in Windows or doing it in Linux. Maybe you want to try both. This is a great way to go about it. So um, I'm going to go into my programming folder um, 
we'll do uh, Linux um, Linux apps. So we have nothing inside here. Um, now, I, like I said, I have Visual Studio Code installed, um, but I'm going to show you what it's like to do with without that installed. Um, you can use Nano, um, and actually, I don't know if it, it does that. So in Linux, to create a file, you do the word touch, and then we'll just do test.c. And then we can look and see that file now exists. So we can do um, nano test.c. And this is just a standard text editor. Um, and I will do, um, is it uh, stdio.h? Um, and that's standard IO. That gives me printf. Um, create a main. And then we'll, we'll just do a simple hello world inside here. Um, and if you're not familiar with C programming, this is this is the simplest thing in, in, with any programming. Obviously, you first thing you do is is you create a hello world just to see if you can. Um, but you any functions that you use that are not part of just the built-in system, which pretty much is everything, um, you have to include a, a, a header file. Um, like in this case, uh, stdio is standard input output um, that contains the print F function, uh, which lets you um, print to the, to the uh, standard out to the, um, basically to the command prompt. Um, and then all C programs, uh, they start in the uh, uh, main um, uh, application here. So we will write out and then exit. I'm not very <laughs> nimble with nano. So just to double check, we'll, uh, Look at the contents of uh, test.c, and there we go. So then we will GCC. Uh, so we're going to say compile test.c and make the output test. No messages means it worked. So now we have two files, test.c and test. And to execute in Linux, you do dot forward slash and then the file, in this case, test. Oh. Missed, um, I didn't put a new line. There we go. Okay, so we confirm that we are able to compile, um, able to edit the files, everything's working correctly. So um, now uh, we just have to open this up in, in Visual Studio Code and get that set up. Um, that simple code and then dot that'll open up visual studio code and this you just have to make sure that you have visual studio code already installed which I had that ages ago Hey, it wants to load a bunch of stuff, but here we go. And there's our Hello World application. Now, to be able to actually uh, run this from here, oh, so that, that's another thing that I wanted to show. Um, we can use GDB. Oh, okay. So GDB is the, the debugger. Uh, and this is all, like I said, it's all command line bigger here so you can see it um, GB test now you'll notice it puts a bunch of stuff out on the screen but then it also tells us here uh, reading symbols from test no debugging symbols found so we have to specifically compile it with debugging symbols so let me bring that up again and so we preface this with dash G so now just 
to make sure it's still working right. And if we run GDB again with test, it says reading symbols from test, done. So the main reason for that is you can do a list that shows you the contents of it and you can step through the file. So for example, here we can say break, uh, break four. So that means when we reach line four while executing uh, or we're setting a breakpoint, it's going to stop execution and let us do whatever we, we want. So if we run it, we're starting the program and it's saying, okay, we, we reached line four, here's a break. You can do anything that you want uh, at this point. Uh, we have nothing going on here, so uh, we're just gonna say continue. It says hello world, then it exits and exit normally. So debugger's working, um, but it is, it's, it's very unruly. Uh, it's very difficult to use from the command line unless you're uh, really comfortable with the command line. Um, I'm, I'm there, but I, I'll show you the reason why I like Visual Studio a little better. So let me, um, or Visual Studio Code a little better. So, all right, so we have our um, file here. We have our test and everything like that. Uh, now we want to be able to actually um, execute uh, code. Well, we want to be able to build, um, so run that, um, that command line to run GCC to build. Uh, but we also want to be able to run the debugger. Uh, which will give us more visual style debugging within the actual program here. Um, and you know what, let's make a, another program that's a little more complex so we can we can actually see how that's gonna work. Um, and I'll do uh, a new file, we'll call it, um, you know what, I won't create a new file yet. We will just, um, We'll create a new uh, we'll, we'll add a variable to this and we'll put hello world in that oops didn't mean to do that okay and then when we print we're gonna say we want to print a string, which is the hello world up there. And then we will print that out. So we're already working inside of uh, Visual Studio. Let's go ahead and do that. And then, so still working, nothing else, nothing's changed. Um, instead of hello world, we'll say hello variable. That way we know it's different. we go so now we're not just printing hello world directly we're actually setting a variable first and then putting it out in there so how do we build from Visual Studio how do we set that up to build um, there's a couple of ways to do it so I found this and this just tells you how to set up a Visual Studio code for um, uh, C++ um, in uh, Windows sus subsystem for Linux, WSL. Um, but, you know, it, it works with uh, C and C++. Uh, they're kind of interchangeable. Um, the, the real difference is instead of um, uh, um, GCC, use uh, GPP. Uh, G, G++. Yeah, use G++ to compile C++. Uh, I'll get to that eventually, uh, but I'm still, I'm still putzing around with uh, C. Um, so I, I kind of like that. I'm going to stick with that. So uh, this I found, it's just a tutorial on uh, setting this up. I'm going to kind of breeze through it. Um, it's making sure that you have in this case, Ubuntu installed, um, the build essential, which we set up, um, and the GDB, that's we set that up as well. Um, creating our application, 
Uh, oh, yeah. And this is another big thing you want to make sure that when you're in here, that this is WSL. Um, you can't see that because I have it blocked. <laughs> Let me... You can see it right here. WSL. And then it'll say whatever your, your Windows subsystem for Linux is. In this case, mine's Debian. If you have Ubuntu, it'll say Ubuntu. Um, and this just it shows that it's connected so what's happening in the background what you don't see is that um, um, I just realized why you don't see that on here I need to, to change something here um, what's happening in the background uh, Linux is running a server and the um, Visual Studio code is communicating with the server in order to get um, that in, in order to get um, the uh, the debugging and, and everything as well as the build and all of that working um, let me change this so that it fits on the screen now okay I realized I changed, um, I took off on my second screen because I'm, I'm using two monitors on this screen. I used to have uh, all of the um, the toolbar, um, the Windows toolbar down there. Um, and I realized it was using up real estate that I would rather have. You still can't see because the recent follower is blocking it. So let me move that over. I'll get this. Eventually. There we go. Now you can see better. Okay, so we're trying to set up debugging. Well, building and debugging. So um, this is kind of cool. Um, what Visual Studio Code does is when you have um, settings it will create its own folder uh, called dot vs code um, that's normally hidden um, and in Linux you can do ls dash um, a to see hidden files uh, in this case we don't have anything um, there's just dot and dot dot which takes you back so um, this will actually create them for us automatically uh, we don't have to worry about that uh, oh yeah, and you want to have the C and C++ extension installed. Um, make sure that, uh, you know, you have the latest version. Don't go off of whatever's currently in here. Um, that That's real important to be able to do things like, um, in this case, the, um, uh, the coloration, um, syntax highlighting, as well as if I hover over printf, it gives me information about it. Um, as I'm typing, IntelliSense works. That's real nice. Um, you didn't, I didn't have that at all. You probably saw it as I was typing the uh, variable C, um, setting that up. I, I have that. Um, you don't get that in something like Nano, so it's real nice to have. Um, and you, you get to that, um, was it Control Shift P, install, install extensions and you just search for uh, C slash C plus plus and you can see this right here that's how you set that up that's more of a Visual Studio Code thing um, so uh, I'll leave that up to you if, if you want to go that route so um, yeah so here's the sample source code um, they're just showing making sure that that things are working correctly um, and then now to build, this is the, the kind of cool thing. Um, you go to, what is it? Terminal configure default build task. In this case, we're going to do, um, GCC build active file. Uh, that way, whatever file we're looking at. So right now it's test.c. If I run the build command, it will build that file. But if I create a new file, and I'm in that one and I run the build command, it will build that file instead. So um, here's the defaults, uh, CPP build, that's fine. The command is user bin GCC. 
you might want to double check that that's the case. So you say which um, GCC, user bin GCC, good, okay. This label, um, it's not important what this label is. It's, it's good to be descriptive, but you want to make sure that you have that for later uh, when, you, when you set up the debugging. Um, arguments, um, this is, so this is, what this is doing, the arguments, is what we put into here. So GCC is the command. That's the command, GCC. Arguments dash G. I've got that there. The file, in this case, if I run build from this file, it will substitute that out here. So it'll be test.c, which we have there. And then O for output. And then um, this just puts it into the same directory, make sure that it's the same directory and that it's the base file name with no extension. So in this case, if it's test.c, it will output test. Um, there are other options in here. And this is where we'll go later um, when I do socket pro programming uh, um, or uh, like multi-threading. Uh, if you have to link something uh, with a linker, this is this is where you would add um, extra things. So, for example, you know, if I'm going to do GCC, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm going to do GCC, if I want to add something onto the end, like for example, when I added dash G, um, this is you know how I'd normally do it. In here, I would go in here and add like say another another option. Um, or sorry, another argument. Options, we can ignore that for now. Uh, everything else uh, should be fine. Um, the one thing, no, okay. Yeah, this is, this is right. So everything in here is exactly where it needs to be. So we'll save that. And if you notice, it created that .vs code file, uh, or folder, sorry, and then it created this tasks.json. If we go back here, whoops. You can see now there's a .vs code file. And if we do that, we've got our task.json. So now, if we go here and we, um, let's delete permanently. Yes, I wanna delete it. So there is no uh, test executable anymore. So if we go to um, terminal uh, run task build, or run build task, you see down here, it shows you starting build, and you can see GCC, dash G, and then this gives you the full path to that file, um, and then the O, and then the full path, and you can see it, it recreated that. So then now that we have that, we can do um, that. And once again, it's, it's now built. And just to double check, we'll uh, control shift B to build finish successfully. And if we go here now, hello variable again. So now we're compiling from Visual Studio code uh, and that's great. But now we want to be able not only um, you know, we have to come here to, to run it and to debug it and everything um, and we, we can do that, uh, GDB test. And if we do a list on here, we can say, we want to break on line four again, so that when we run, we can now see if we print, uh, C it's empty. And if we do in for next, it executed that line, it executed line four, and then now it's on line five waiting to execute that. And if we do uh, print C again, we now see that it contains the string hello world again, or so, hello variable again. And we can even see the memory address there. Um, what's kind of cool is that you can do a, um, uh, what is it, X, um, we'll do uh, 16 bits, say 16 C for characters, uh, zero, you know what, let's just let's make this easier. I'm gonna copy this memory address and then paste it here. 
and we can actually look at memory itself. So um, in that first address, 04, it's H. Um, and if we, you know, look at the memory, it goes all the way up to, you know, hello, comma, space, variable. Um, oh, you know what? We actually need to see more. Let's look at 32. So yeah, you can see it's a, um, it's a, uh, a pointer to, um, uh, a, a pointer to a char. Um, in this case, it is a, a null terminated string. In this case, it's a zero uh, is the end. So that's how you know you've reached the end of that string. Strings in C are fun, but this is not, this is unwieldy. This is not fun to, to do. So, and you saw it setting the breakpoint. You know, I can't look at my whole, all the code and everything like that. Uh, so I want to set that up to be able to execute it within Visual Studio Code, be able to step through it that way and get what I need out of it. So um, in here, let's see, this is the tasks and this is uh, this is just showing what we did before. And you can see the difference, um, you know, this, this is showing how to use G++. I'm not doing G++, I'm doing uh, GCC for now, so I'm not too worried about that. So that was running, and then now we want to go into debugging. So um, we want to go to run and add configuration. Um, we're going to choose C++ uh, for uh, GDB, LLDB. GDB is the debugger we're using. Um, and then this gives us the options. We're going to say uh, uh, we're going to build and debug the active file then we're going to, um, there we go. Okay, so now it's coming up with the options for launching. So you can see here the pre-launch task is C, C++, GCC, build active file. That is what this label is. If you made a change to this, you're gonna have to make a change to that as well. That's, that's the thing to really um, keep an eye on. So for this, uh, this is just build and then debug is what's what's going to do. Um, it's going to launch the program. Okay, that's that's the uh, file. So it's, this is what it's going to um, the program is going to launch. If you need to put in uh, an argument, let's say for example you're programming a uh, uh, like a let's say you're you're trying to recreate the ping command. Um, you know, ping takes command line arguments. That's where you would pass those in here. Um, this is an entry, this is a fun thing I like to do. Stop at entry. Um, I like to say true to this. That means um, when you start debugging, remember I had to set a breakpoint uh, on line four? This automatically sets that for us. So as soon as it hits the main, it breaks and then lets you do whatever you want to it. Um, the working directory, we're just going to keep it the way it is. The environment, everything's the same. Everything else is the same. Ignore failures, true. That's fine for now. And so now, when we run... Um, let's say debug anyway. Let's see what happens. doesn't like that. What is wrong with that? Let's go back to the Explorer VS Code. So launch.json, that's, that's what we want. Um, go back to the run and it's... Oh. <laughs> We're trying to run that file. We don't want to run that file. We want to run this file. So we'll build first, build successful, and we'll run it. And there we go. So now it's doing the same thing that we did before, but now it, it's done a couple of things. It's automatically looking at the variables, the local variables. Um, it sets up a watch area. It shows us the call stack, and 
it shows us the whole program code uh, and where we're at, and it gives us options to, um, you can't see those, can you? There we go. It gives us options to uh, just continue. Um, so that would be, you know, just continuing on running. You can step into, step over, uh, yeah, step over, step into, and then step out. So in this case, uh, just like we did before from the command line, if we do uh, step over, it's like, like hitting in for next. That then executes that line and sets C now equal to this. Now, this is where things are a little interesting. Uh, you can't look at the, um, the memory the way you can in, like, say, other... Um, uh, other applications, other uh, development environments, things like uh, Visual Studio, um, but it does give you the uh, the address. So what you can do with that? Uh, let me see if I can copy. I don't copy the value. Um, so let's do the memory address of C. That doesn't seem right, but let me try this. And then down here, you can do uh, the same thing that I did before. Um, EXEC, uh, uh, we did 32 characters, um, and then that address. And let me bring this up. And, hmm. Okay, that's not important um the main thing is that we now have this this actually working so if, if i actually put in the right memory address it's uh I believe that's right yeah yeah so there we see in this case we get all the uh all the 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 memory and we can we can look at this in different ways we can look at it as um uh, that's bits, no, 32, that's 32 bytes. We can look at it as, um, trying to remember, you can also do, um, X, or you can do help X, and that gives you, let's see, address, decimal, Hex, okay, hex. So let's look at the hex values of that. So yeah, you can look at you can look at memory directly that way. Um, it doesn't have an easy way to really make that happen, uh, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah. So let's get rid of that watch variable. Let's shrink this back down because we don't need it that large. Okay. And then yeah, we're we're back to you know looking at. This, you can say continue, and then boom, we've, we've got it. So now we're at a point where we can create new files and do whatever we want. So um, let's, uh, well, let me first change back to here. Uh, I don't need to see the tasks or the launch anymore. So we're set up, we're ready to go, and we can now start developing in, uh, in C. So we'll do something like, um, Want it in that folder? <laughs> we'll do it. There we go. We'll create a new file called pointers.c. Include. And you can see it's auto, you know, auto filling some things. So if we do um, auto indentions, nice as well. Uh, we'll do int uh, uh, j equals four. And we'll just, we'll build that, make sure it's working. And we'll execute it with F5. And look at that. We'll step over, I don't remember the F10. It updates the variables over here. Um, and then we can, uh, like I said, we can do 
address of J. That shows us the uh, what's in what's in the memory there, and we can do that same thing in the console. We can do um, copy the value of this. And in this case, we'll just say we just want to see the memory. And there we go. That is a uh, representation of, of what's in memory there. So um, let's actually, let's continue. We'll um, rerun that. Let's take a look at what's in memory right now. So we'll copy the value there, go to debug. Right now it's got nothing in memory. Step over. That memory location was updated. Memory is updated, so cool. So that's one of the uh, the things to really know about uh, C is that everything is you're dealing with raw memory. Um, that's you know people you know talk about you want to talk about something that's uh, a hard typed or soft typed language. Um, C uh, C sharp. Java, C++, excuse me. These are all uh, hard typed languages. Um, not hard typed as in what it sounds like when I'm mashing on the keyboard here, but hard typed as in, for example, in this case, um, I had to specify that this is an integer, um, that that J is an integer. Um, and the reason being is that it's just storing something in memory. It doesn't it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't care what it is. Um, and so you're going to store things in memory. You're going to take them out of memory. And so the language needs to know, needs to understand what it is you're storing. Like what form is that? What format is that? Um, without, uh, without knowing that that's, uh, uh, you know, exactly, uh, it doesn't store it with it. The program keeps track of what type that variable is. So, for example, in something like JavaScript, you can, um, you know, give it a number, and it could be it could be a number, it could be a string, it could be any any number of things, um, and that's actually kind of important to to look at. So, let's say, um, you know, you have you have numbers, but then you also have the representation of a number. In this case, let's say the, the number four, um, if we do a char uh, C um, equals four, which is which is a string, um, let's see, will that compile? It compiled, but it doesn't like that uh, because it needs to be a pointer. There we go. Okay. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So you can see that C, okay, we want to look at um, memory address for C. Is that what I... Okay. So if we look at... Um, wrong way. Uh, let's look at four bytes. Characters. Okay. So the way C is um, stored so C is a, is a character variable and this is this is part of the reason that C is the way it is um, so J is updated and now J is four it, it literally is the number four uh, in binary stored in, in memory um, and we can actually look at that by going to um, let's look at this memory address um, I think it's B is is how you look at the binary representation. 
Um, I could be, I could be wrong, but, uh, okay. So we'll, we'll look at the hex value. The hex value is four, um, which equates to four. Um, so that's stored as, as, as one byte, um, in one byte, um, that integer. So that, that, um, that J variable is one byte long. Uh, so it's, it's eight bits. Um, char on the other hand is just a pointer to something. And in this case, it's a pointer to, to nothing right now, but if we then, oh, it's a pointer to location memory, but now we've actually set that in memory. So now if we go and look at the uh, representation of what that is, um, no, that is a different memory address than that. Um, so let me, let me put that in. Uh, yeah, so you can see here, it's actually stored because it's a, it's a, the, the, the ASCII representation of the number four. So it's not the number four, it's a string of the number four. Uh, and that's actually uh, 52 in, um, uh, in ASCII. Um, if we look at what it is in hex, it's 34. Yeah, you can see 52 is, is what that is here. So um, if we look here at the ASCII table, if we look at 52, it's the number four. So if we were to go in and modify memory and say set, uh, set that to, let's say, 89, it would be a capital Y instead. So um, this is this is part of the reason that in JavaScript and other languages sometimes uh, you're operating on something that you think is a number and it turns out it's not a number. It's actually a string. And that's, that's the difference. It's the number four. It's the ASCII representation of the number four. But it's not actually the number four. It is uh, a completely different... Um, uh, set of, of bytes in memory. Um, so instead of being four, it's 34 in hex uh, or 52 in decimal. So, okay. Um, yeah, so that's how we can debug. That's how we can, you know, take a look at, at memory locations and things like that. One of the cool things about C as well is, is you know, you're dealing, like I said, you're dealing directly with memory. Um, and you have ways of doing, let's say, um, so I'm going to clear that out. We're, we're going to play around with pointers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create, um, uh, we'll, we'll bring J back actually. We'll make it two. And then what I want to do is actually double that. So we'll create a function, um, Double value. It takes an integer of x and it sets that that variable x equal to um, x times two. So it, it doubles and then it returns x. All right. So then what that's going to do is double value. J okay so what this does is we set a variable in other words we set a location in memory with the the value 2 we then pass in that value to this function it creates its own variable its own location in memory x and it sets that x equal to whatever was passed into it. Then it does some processing, and then it returns that value that it got. So in this case, for example, we'll, we'll set 
um, uh, y equal to that. So now we have two variables. So we have three variables. Two of them are local in scope to main. They only exist in main. And then x only exists within this double value function. So let's build this. And then let's step through this line by line. I'll take out these watches because we don't need them anymore. Okay, so we're starting off. J and Y are both zero. They're both empty. And then J gets set to two. And then now we're actually going to step into this function. So we've passed the the value of j to this function. So we pass the number 2 to this function. x is now set. This is basically saying, like, at the very beginning, x equals, um, or, yeah, initialize x with the value that was passed into it. Um, at this point, j doesn't exist as far as this can see. It doesn't see the value j. It doesn't see the memory. It doesn't see anything. It then operates on x. So we'll step over that. Now x is four. Now j's not been modified. J is still is still two. We're gonna step out of it. And you can see what it's done is it's given us the return value. In this case, the return value is now four. So this, you can basically replace this, this whole line here, double value j. You can replace it with the number four and it's basically setting y equal to what that returns, in this case, 4. So we'll step over. And now y equals 4. x is gone. And if we add a watch, there is no x. x is not there. Because it only existed within here. And we're not in there anymore. We're outside of it. So now j has not been updated. And y is now a new variable. You can do some interesting things as well. You could say, for example, um, if we don't want to have a separate one, we, we want to double J by just getting the results of this and setting J now to, to this. But <clears throat> watch how this, this works. So we just built and then we're running. So J is the only variable that exists. We're going to step over that, set it to two. Then we're going to step into here. We've created a new variable, which is X, and we've copied in the value of j into x. We've copied that, copied in 2 into this new memory location. Currently x is 2. Now we're going to double x. We're, we're going to times x by 2, and then we're going to set it back to uh, set it back to, to x. So we're going to overwrite what's currently in x with x times 2, which is 4. So now we're going to return. That gives us the return value of 4. And we're going to, in turn, take that and set j with that. So now j is equal to 4. So it had to create new, a, a new variable in memory. It had to modify that variable. And it had to do some, some stuff with it. So how can we do that faster, more efficiently, and make things you know, kind of streamline a little bit. We can use pointers. So we'll create a new function called um, uh, double um, value um, ref. This is, it'll make sense in a second. Um, we do uh, a reference of x. Okay, so this this copies this passes variables in uh, via copy. It copies the contents of this variable into into a new location in memory. That's not a problem when you have something like this. However, let's say we're doing this, you know, a, you know, a million times, or for example, we're doing something larger, a structure that contains a whole bunch of other data and we're passing that in. We don't want to copy all of that. It, it, it could be, you know, a, a couple couple hundred megs 
uh, of data that we're copying into this new variable. So we've got duplicate data now. Uh, and then we're going to have to, in turn, write that back out when we come back out of the function. Um, so instead, we want to manipulate that memory directly. So what we're doing here is instead of, see, in this case, it returned a value that's an integer. In this case, we're saying this is void. It's not going to return a value. It's not re going to return anything. Instead, we're taking in a, uh, a reference to the memory location, and we're setting x to that memory location. So then now, if we take j, and instead of uh, doubling it this way, we say double value ref, and we pass it in j. Actually, we're going to pass the memory location of j. We're going to pass a reference of j. That's what that ampersand means. It means um, what this is is the memory location, and then this is a pointer representation of that memory location. So then all we have to do in here is say x equals x times 2. And in this case, return just means return back. Oh, yeah. We actually want to do, this is going to be, we want uh, to set, we want to set the value of x. That's what, that's what this, uh, the, the star next to the variable name means. It means it is a, it is the value of, um, of that memory location. So this is, this is um, not the same as this. It's a little confusing. This is, I believe, called the um, uh, operand. No, that's not the operand. Uh, I'm, I'm getting my terms mixed up here. Um, this basically says this is going to be a pointer. This says we want the actual contents of x. We're going to set it to what this is. In this case, the contents of x times 2. So let's save that and build it, make sure everything was successful. And now when we step through this, we're going to see things a little different. So J is now zero and we will set that. J is now set to two. And so now we're going to step into here and now X no longer is two. Um, it's no longer a copy. Instead, it's pointing to the memory location that J is. And if we dereference it with that um, with that star, we get two. So in this case, we're going to take this, which is currently two. We're going to take that and times it by two. Same thing we did before. So we're going to step over. Now that memory location has been updated. It's now four. So we we modified what was given to us. We didn't modify a copy of it. We modified it directly. And then when we step out of it, back into the main thing, there's no return value. There's no having to set anything. It literally is, it's done. It's just said and done. Everything's good. Um, this works, this works for multiple things. Um, so for example, if you want to do um, you know, passing in multiple things. If, if we wanted to say, um, you know, uh, we'll say void double values, um, we'll say double many values. Uh, and if, you know, x, y, z. Let's say we're we're doing some, uh, you know, manipulation to. Uh, oh yeah, it has to be. <laughs> I have to say that they're all ints. So let's say I'm doing that. You know, this could grow and be quite large. Instead, what I can do is actually we'll uh, we'll get rid of these. We'll get rid of these because we don't need them. So. How do you pass a bunch of data? You do it with a, with a structure. 
So in this case, it's going to be, uh, let's say, coordinates. And it's going to have um, an integer uh, x, Oops. an integer y, and an integer z. So in here, we create a new um, struct. Um, game coordinates. Um, oh wait, we have to that. Okay, right now uh, we have a structure that has data in it and that data is, uh, is not set. So let's say um, game chords dot X is gonna be uh, one, let's see. Y is going to be 2, and Z is going to be 3, just so we can see how this, this math. Um, so if we do uh, double mini values, um, you know, we'd have to pass them in one by one, or we could pass it in as that, and that would mean we'd have to change this to be... Um, structure, um, coordinates, or chords, uh, and it would be um, working chords, because that's what we're working with. So we're going to say, uh, now there's, there's different notation on this, so if we want to, let's say, double working uh, coordinates, um, uh, we want to double its, uh, you know, x, y, and z. Uh, x, y, and z. We do um, working chords. Uh, is it? We're gonna do the address of that x um, equals. And then the same thing again, times two. Um, I'm, I'm missing something here. I'm trying to remember uh, how we reference that directly. Let's try setting it directly like this. Um, and work out what we need to do to make that work. So in this case, we're working with a, okay. Yeah, in this case, we're working with a, a pointer. So we use the um, arrow notation. Um, let's see if we build that. That actually works. I didn't think it would work that way. Um, let's step through it now and see. So we're gonna so game coordinates. Right now it's it's filled with garbage data. So if we step through, x is now one, y is two, z is three, and then we're gonna step into this. So now working chords is that that's exactly what we were looking for. So we're gonna step over and then set it. And then we're going to step out of, and now game coordinates has been updated. Perfect. So all we have to do is we'll say um, we'll say double chords. go. All right, we'll build that, make sure it works correctly. Okay, and we're just going to run through this. Well, hold on. 
one second. Outside Donald. Okay, it sounds like a dog is being murdered outside, but um, it actually, that's that's just how that dog sounds. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. Um, and I need to move this thing over again a little bit. There we go. Okay. All right. So, okay. So just like before, we're going to step over set one, two, and three. And we're going to step into this function. And once again, one, two, and three, it has that. We're going to step over each one of these. So it's going to double uh, one to two, two to four, three to six. And this, once again, instead of copying all of the coordinates, it's copying, ju or it's, it's just passing in the memory location. So it's getting to update it directly. So then now when the game, when it comes back from that, it's all been doubled. Um, and this is, this is, you know, great. Let's say for example, I'm, I'm doing this as, as game coordinates. Let's say we're, you know, doing this with a, with a huge, um, uh, you know, with a game that has, you know, uh, the, the coordinates of, let's say, 100 players or something like that, you wouldn't want to copy all 100 players one by one into a new location of memory, um, you know, running through that process uh, and, and then and then having to, to then clear that memory out. It would be a nightmare, it, an absolute nightmare. This modifies it directly. Now, modern programming actually... Um, especially things like uh, like web servers and, and things like that, uh, that can be a little dangerous because then you start running into, um, you know, basically you, you run into to conditions where, uh, you know, someone, let's say, logged into a server or serving up pages from one, one site uh, can then see what's in memory uh, uh, from another. Um, that that can that can be dangerous uh, with that, so you have to really space these out and make sure that you're using them properly, you know, in the right way. But uh, for our purposes, right now, that's it's not a problem. It's it's going to be fine. So um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's probably gonna about it let's uh you know what let's let's add something else let's add in a um just for giggles uh, a char pointer called name because we want to uh oh yeah let me stop execution of that uh so for example we want to create a um uh you know, player name. So, uh, player one. Okay. So how do we handle this? It's the same thing. Um, but let's say we want to, uh, modify the, the player name or something like that. So how do we get the player name out of here? Well, do the same thing, working chords, um, name, Let's, uh, let's see. Does that work? We shall see. Okay, so we're going to skip through here. Um, name, okay, yeah, name is not currently set. Step over, and now it's set. In the tooltip, it shows what it's set to. Okay, so then we will... 
Let's step over that and see what happens. Player updated. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, pointers, pointers can be really, really weird to work with sometimes, you know, especially uh, if you're if you're not too familiar with them. Um, in this case, this this came out real, <laughs> real easy. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't too difficult. Um, but I've had I've had situations where pointers are just, you know, it, it's it it can be it can be very confusing, um, depending on what your understanding of where things are, what your what you're working with. The main thing to to remember is when you're when you're passing something as a reference, you're passing a pointer to a function. Um, you want to pass it by reference using this, which means the the address of that. So, as an example, let me run this again. Um, and if we put a watch on. Um, game chords you see that's the actual address of that so um, let's look at the at the memory location of that so uh, we want to look at the character representation of that and we'll say okay so this is going to be one byte, two bytes, three bytes, and then however long the name is, uh, which the longest one is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen for the null. So fifteen, so eighteen bytes altogether is is how big this is this is actually going to get. So right now, it's set with arbitrary data. So we're going to step over and let's uh, let's look and see if this got updated. So the first memory location should now be set to one. Cool, and it is. And all the structure is, all this is, is it tells us that this block of memory is going to hold this this information. So actually, uh, the name isn't going to be stored in this memory, but the address to the name will be stored in this memory location. So let's step over again. Two is now set. Um, oh yeah, okay. One, two, three, four. Let's take a look at this in hex. Okay. So there is our first, our one, our two. So this is one, two, three, four. So it's four bytes. Okay. So it's it's laid out differently than I was than I was thinking. Um, so yeah, so one takes up these four bytes, two, one, two, three, four. So the X40, when we execute the next line, should now be, um, yeah, it should be three. There we go. Yep. So, okay, because it's, because it's in a structure, it, it lays it out in memory slightly different and then this part name right now is set to um it, it's set to garbage in memory it's it's a memory address but it's set to garbage um so okay so yeah this this is going to be a lot larger than i thought it was going to be so let's say let's go ahead and set that okay so now name points to that memory address um so let's look at uh, 36 bytes and see where we get that. Uh, I think we need to go a little higher. And 
and I believe we're looking at uh, <laughs> um, things in Little Indian. So 55, okay. So 55, 55, 55, 55. That's this, which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, one, five, zero, B, six, oh, one, three. So it doesn't match up exactly what I'm thinking, but um, I think that has to do with uh, the in Indianness. So, um, for example, everything everything is stored um, backwards than what you may what you might, may be expecting, um, because it's it's the the little end first. Um, and little Indian, E-N-D-I-A-N, -N, comes from uh, Gulliver's Travels. Um, literally, people who eat eggs, uh, the little end first, or the big end first. Um, and that's, computers are laid out, their memory is laid out. Uh, you read them, little Indian or big Indian first. So, in this case, um, you know, uh, B051, um, you flip that around, it's, um, uh, you, you, it's storing this memory address and it's storing all these other numbers completely backwards. So for example, um, you know, X is stored starting here, zero, all zeros, and then this last one is one. Um, I may be wrong in, in how I'm calculating this memory address here as well. So, um, cause I feel like, Oh wait, Oh, I am. I'm completely wrong. I was, I was a few lines down. Here's the address. 55, 55, 55, 55, 60, 13. Ignore me. <laughs> so yeah. So that is the address for name. In this case, it's, um, player one. So then when you pass that in, it passes this, um, this memory address is what working coordinates gets set to. So we can actually see that. Um, if we go, are we on that one? Yeah. Step into working chords. Uh, if we hover over it, yep, is 0x7 F F F F F E D or sorry E two D zero, so it just points to where game chords was stored in memory. So all it all it did was says, and, and this is this is why it's hard typed because what it's doing is it's saying okay this variable is made up of this structure, so. This address holds data in this form so that then when you reference it, like say this and then X, it knows that X is stored in the first, um, the first four bytes. So it is able to pull out those four bytes and manipulate them and work with them. Um, same thing for the, the, the name. It knows that this is a char array. It knows this is their char pointer. It knows to look to um, to this address and that that address holds a um, a char. And actually we can we can um, pull that out as well. So if we do um, we'll just say 16 characters. And it was five 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 six zero one three. We can see P L A Y E R space one and then a zero for null termination. So 
that is how it knows what this data is and how to deal with it, how to how to show it, um, how to manipulate it. That's why it's it, it's considered a hard typed language. It's hard typed in that you are going you're telling it this is what this structure is or this is what this data is and that's why you get all kinds of compiler errors and warnings saying that you're you know trying to uh modify a string um or trying to modify something as an integer when it's not an integer it's it's a string because it knows based on the structure of how you wrote your program what that data is supposed to look like so it can warn you of those things you know before it becomes a real problem because then at the same time like this it doesn't care what that memory is after this it it just it sets it it just goes in there and just sets it so this is how you can have let's say like a, a buffer overflow or something like that this when it you create this variable um in here it allocates a certain amount of amount of space on the stack to hold that variable well, if you go over that, um, that's where you get st uh, stack overflow. Um, it, it goes it goes beyond the stack and starts potentially overriding memory in, in another location altogether. Um, there's a lot of thread safety, uh, you know, things in place to try to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, but it's not always perfect. So you may run into a problem where, uh, you know, for example, in this... If you're taking user input uh, to, to set this, um, you know, they could they could insert all kinds of interesting things. Um, they could even insert, uh, let's see, if we put in a, I'm curious how it will react to putting that in. Let's, uh, let's find out. So step over, 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 step into, step over, over, and then when we set that, what is that now set to? Yeah, so we can, we can null terminate that. Um, so it thinks, so yeah, you have to be careful when taking user input. If somebody puts a character like that in, it sets that memory location to, um, you know, to be the, the basically what we've done. When you set this, it is basically the same as saying, that, that is what, um, that is what gets inserted at the end of a string literal. In this case, this is literally, this is what we're saying. We're literally saying we want the string to be in that memory location. So it automatically tacks on that, that null termination, that zero at the end of it, um, which just sets it to, you know, uh, all, all zeros um, for, for that, for that byte. Problem is, is if we, if we move that beforehand, it goes ahead and, and just sets all that in there. The problem is, is that any function is going to look at that and say, oh, we found our null termination, so that's the end of it. We're, we're done with it. Um, that's why you have uh, certain functions also will take the size of the data that you're putting in, that you're sending in um, to make sure that it's uh, only reading as much as, as it needs to. So, for example, if you send in a, um, you know, a, you have a buffer, so let's say an array uh, that holds, you know, 200 um, bytes of data, you don't want to overwrite that. Um, you don't want to go beyond the bounds of that um, because that, that gets into dangerous territory. So if you write a function, you want to take in the buffer and then also the size of the buffer, which is basically the maximum amount that you're going to write to it. That way the function knows to stop when it, when it's done um so yeah that's uh 
think that's about all that I had for this today. Um, I'm, I'm having some major uh, streaming issues. So if you see this and it's really um, choppy or, or not working right on um, Twitch, uh, check out my YouTube uh, because I'll, I'll upload it there. Um, and if this is something you like, if it's something you want to see more of, let me know. Um, I just wanted to show kind of my, uh, setup for, um, you know, working, working in, in C, um, for Linux from, from within Windows. I've, I've been doing this for, for quite a while. I'm still really, really rusty at it, um, because I don't do C very often. Um, Cold Fusion is, is my main language that I, I, I do for my 9-to-5 job that I've been doing for about 8 years, 8-9 eight, years now. So C is more like the hobby language um, that I, I play with sometimes. Um, and so I'm a little rusty with, with pointers. That's part of the reason I'm doing this is so I can teach myself how to do it. Um, and also I, I've really started to like Visual Studio Code. It's, it's really, really showing itself to be pretty rock solid. You can do all these things in regular Visual Studio, which compiles and gives you the memory uh, watching. It gives you a lot of, of um, analytics and a lot of other things that you, could, um, that you, don't, you don't get out of, out of Visual Studio Code. Um, the, the problem is, is that I, I'm wanting to learn, um, socket programming in Windows and in Linux. Um, and, you know, Visual Studio is what you need for Windows programming and, you know, uh, GCC is what you use for Linux and there's not a, um, a very straightforward, easy way to do the the same things that Visual Studio does does in Linux. Um, now that Visual Studio Code is very you know cross platform and, and working really well in, in this regards, it now's a great time to jump in and learn all this stuff. So, um, you know, I I probably got some things wrong here. Uh, maybe I did you know some things right. Uh, who knows? But uh, if you uh, have any comments or questions or uh, anything, um, you can check out my, my Twitch. Um, uh, the, the links are all below. Uh, YouTube is same thing. Uh, find me on there. Um, I'll, I'll put links everywhere. And, my, um, and you can actually see it uh, kind of going by my other way here, go by my head over here. Um, the socials have been flashing up here the whole time. Um, you know, uh, my uh, Twitch right there, YouTube was the last one, same name. Uh, and then uh, uh, Twitter is uh, Freak Zombie 3. Uh, first two were taken already. But um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's going to do it for me. I'm going to sign off and go get some dinner. It's, uh, it's like 7 o'clock and uh, I'm getting kind of hungry. So uh, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you guys next time.